Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Um, if you guys want to stand with us, let's start worship. One, two, three. everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. We are glad you're here. We just have a few announcements for you before we um, move to anything else, but we do hope that you feel welcome. If you need any more details on any of the announcements, they are at the information table for you. And then at gbcbellevue.org on our website, you can get more details as well. And make sure, if you would, please to read the newsletter. I think that sometimes when something comes out regularly, it's easy to just Uh, Ignore it, but those announcements are real important. Keep you up on things. Um, Men's Discipleship Group will meet this evening from 6 to 7.30. We're going to be picking up some of the more difficult elements of one aspect of our sermon today and talk a little bit more about what we did last time we were together. Bart would be glad to help you if you'd like to help with the snacks and setup 
Bart. So if you'd see him, we'd appreciate it. And um, there is a study guide that's available. Uh, there's a portion of the sermon that's especially difficult. Did not feel it was really appropriate for a morning service because it gets into so many questions. But if you'd like more information about one of the more difficult elements, at the information table, and then uh, we'll be using that men for our study group tonight. There is a young adult group kickoff barbecue potluck. Wow. On the 22nd of May, 5.30 p.m., single, married, with or without children. Eric and Becky Lundberg would like to help you with questions with that. Eric and Becky, where are you? There they are. And then the information table as well. You can find out more about that. There is a high school youth group concert trip on the 11th of June that is being planned, Christian Cross Music Festival in Norfolk, Nebraska. And uh, Thomas would be glad to help you with that, or you could um, have a sign up at the information table as well. Some of you, when you came in, received this. It's a uh, Vital Signs book brunch that they're having, and they're going to be going through a book entitled The Apostate. My, inform my information is they're against apostasy. And uh, Dr. Christians has written the book, and uh, Denny Hartford, Denny and Claire can give you more information about that, and these handouts are on the information table as well. Seems to be the place to be today. Now, birthdays. Isaiah Davis will be 15 years old on the 16th of May. Doesn't seem possible. And anniversaries, we have one to announce this week. Scott and Laura Powers on the 16th will have been married 35 years. Congratulations to all of you. Most of you know we don't take up a formal offering. There is a white box in the back if you'd like to put an offering in that. We appreciate that. And then if you'd like to contribute regularly, thank you to many of you who just use your bank accounts for that. And then we have Venmo available as well. We've got some interesting announcements today, and we've got a couple people that are going to share them with us. Dave, wherefore art thou? Come on up. And uh, Interesting day yesterday, wasn't it? An interesting week, Dave, in the last couple weeks. Yes, it has. Um, as many of you know, we've been working on our new space build-out for a little over a year. Yeah. And as the joke around here has been, you know, well, two more weeks two more and we'll weeks. be in there. <laughs> um, and actually, two more weeks we're planning on being in there. Um, I, uh, we still have some things that need to get done in there. We did have a pretty good crew show up yesterday. We've had people in there over the last weeks. A um, bunch of the guys have been in there doing a lot of things for last months. So thanks for everybody that's done that. But um, I would encourage you to watch your emails because we will need to probably have another day or two of a work day, especially as we need to get in there and start setting up chairs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, again, we're currently planning on May 29th. If anything changes, obviously, we'll let you know. Um, also, remember, when we do start down there, church service will start at 10 o'clock. So, kind of start thinking already that you need to get here just a little earlier. So, Yeah. Exciting, isn't it? It's very exciting. Yeah. So. Well, we will... <laughs> get back we will be praying for that in, uh, in our morning prayer here, but uh, once again, I, all the guys on the board have been involved in this, all the guys on the board have been helping, but uh, boy, Dave's been a huge part of that, and so we appreciate, Dave, your leadership with that. Heather, you have something to talk with us about as well. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of a point person for kids' ministry. There are so many people that help us, and we're so thankful. I have a pretty exciting thing for you to think about today. So we really love family worship here, and we're so excited that the kids get to stay in and they get to sing songs with us and they get to pray with us. And if they believed in Jesus and their parents are ready, they can take communion. And so we wanted to encourage you. Um, we have one more thing that the kids could do when they're in, in church, and it's stay in and listen to Pastor Dan and follow along in the Bible and listen. And so we know that that's kind of a big ask for elementary kids sometimes. But I would encourage you that, oh, elementary is the best time to start a really good habit. So um, we know that maybe asking somebody to sit for half an hour or so, 
that might be a lot. So we're, we have a few things to help. So they could sit maybe for a little while and listen. And then when they come in the door, I have some things in my do and tell here. I have some clipboards. I have some books that have activities in them. They could take a couple pages out of that. I have these really cool things. They're cards that you, they're colorful blessing cards. You can color and maybe put that on your mom's pillow and tell you you love her. And there's um, just some plain paper. You could make that into a card for grandma and send it to her. And then I have some really good books. Oh, there's some good ones. These are our favorites. These are from our personal read library. So you could take one of these and when you're kind of done listening, oh, grandma's attic. Anyway, I get very excited here. And we have some pencil um, things in here. Now notice that all these things are low mess and quiet. So you can borrow those things and then take home the things that you color and make and then put everything back in my cart when you're done. And so this is kind of our soft start and we get to the new building. We're gonna have more room, which means we can have more things. But this is what we're gonna use right now. And then you can also bring your own. So think about what you might wanna bring to help you to be able to sit and listen. So you could bring a, a bag or a backpack with your Bible in it, or you could bring a notebook and some pencils. Remember, we're trying not to be messy, so maybe not markers, and maybe not Play-Doh, but things like that. And then you can listen, and next month, I think, I'm gonna start some listening challenges where I might have some things that I might say, Pastor Dan's gonna talk about teachable. So I want you to listen for the word teachable and come and tell me what you heard about it, and then there might be a reward. So those are some of the things that we'd like to encourage kids to sit in class. Now that doesn't mean that you have to, or sit in class, to sit in the sermon. You don't have to do that. You get a choice, and moms and dads are gonna help make that choice whether you're gonna go to class during church or whether you're gonna stay in church. But do remember that once we get in the new building, we're gonna have Bible study hour for everybody so the kids can come and they can have their class and then they could sit in church. And if you have any questions about that, because that might seem like a big ask for some of you, um, come and talk to me, and I've got some friends that can help give some guidance on how to be quiet and still. And I'll just tell you now, I had one that I had to pick between quiet and still. I didn't get both. So I chose quiet, and we had a little place kind of back in the back, and he could kind of be not so still. But you know what was surprising is he would still know what the pastor said. So that's something to think about too, parents. Just because we can't be quiet and still for the whole time, we could probably work at it. It's kind of a progress thing that we're working on. So if you have any questions, super excited for the kids to stay in if that's what parents want them to do. And if you need some help with that, just come find me. And I have a lot of friends to introduce you to, so that'll be good. Thanks, Heather. Oh, I'm gonna keep the... Appreciate it. Sounds fun. I want some of those coloring things as well while I'm preaching. Um, one last uh, announcement. There's, uh, Julie, you have on here no stacking chairs today. What's that all about? End of service stuff. Got it. Got it, got it. Well, we're excited you're here. Every morning when we start our service, we begin by breaking bread together. And then at the end of service, we take the cup. And we do that, and I especially want to direct this toward visitors if you're new to church. We do that because what Christ did for us on the cross is very meaningful for us. Jesus Christ offers eternal life as a free gift to anyone who believe in Christ alone for it. And we all think that's amazing. And because we think that's amazing, we hope you do too. And we'd love to tell you how you can have everlasting life too, just by believing in him. Love to talk to you more about that. For believers, we take about one minute of silent prayer, kind of to get our hearts settled before the Lord. It's a time when I say, Lord, is there anything between you and me this morning? And gives us an opportunity to confess that. And as you do, you're able to continue to enjoy fellowship with God. So we're going to take the bread now, and we're going to take that moment of prayer and then after, after that, we'll, um, the men will direct you to where the bread is. So let's have prayer together.
Father, we thank you today that we can be here to gather with other believers for the freedoms that we have to do this. We know there are many who do not. And I do thank you, Father, for what your spirit is doing in our fellowship. Things like a building don't make the church, but it's a good place for us to gather, and we thank you that we're coming to a completion of that project. Thank you so much for what Heather and the others are doing to build a ministry for it so that the children can better learn and grow and we can have an atmosphere in this fellowship that will honor you. And I pray as we think about what we can do that it will all be revolved around glorifying Jesus Christ. Father, we come with all kinds of emotions and with all kinds of mornings. So I pray that no matter what our day has been so far, that you would quiet our hearts and help us to be teachable, that your spirit would instruct and that Christ would be honored. Thank you so much for this bread that represents the body that was given for each one of us. In Christ's name, amen. If you would. Thank you, Alexandra. <laughs> Those of you that have conceal and carries, if you'd stay around after church to protect me, I would appreciate that. <clears throat> America is a nation that is absolutely obsessed with the approval of other people. If you don't believe me, just join one of the groups on social media, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever it might be, Instagram. Everybody lives to get likes and approval from other people. And that's very different from the atmosphere I grew up in. In the atmosphere I grew up in, free speech was a big deal, and we were taught you should be independent thinkers. Today, it's groupthink. I want to read you something about a CEO of a corporation. Um, I think I know how to pronounce this right. Is it Parag Ag uh, Agrawals? He took over uh, an executive position in Twitter. And in a 2018 interview, he said this. Twitter should focus less on thinking about free speech, but thinking about how the times have changed. Where our role is particularly emphasized, he said, is who can be heard. Really? Who can be heard. And he went on to say, and so increasingly, our role is moving toward how we recommend content, how we direct people's attention, what's allowed to be said. It's kind of a dangerous movement. He, he expressed that he, I watched an interview where he talked about really wasn't that enamored with the idea of free speech, but instead wants to talk about what should be heard by people. I got a question for him. Who determines what should be heard? So it's your opinion, what you think is right, what you think is true. There was a reason that the founding fathers thought that free speech should be in the First Amendment. They thought it was important that people's voices be heard, even if you disagreed with those voices. But today, as I say, as I say, the driver today is people want 
acceptance by others. And what's really strange about that is it appears that acceptance starts at 51%. If you're part of the 49% crowd, then you're out. Everybody else is going to decide for you what's politically correct, what's right, what's true, what's good to be thought. So more than ever, we live for people of acceptance. And for many of us, that desire for acceptance is driven by our own personal insecurities, inferiorities, inadequacies that we face. It's a problem I have. I'm driven oftentimes by my own insecurities, and I fight that. And uh, fortunately, and to some degree unfortunately, the Lord has been working on that in my life for a number of years. My guess is I'll go to the grave with the struggle. The struggle isn't wrong. What's wrong is when I give in to that. Because many, many times in the ministry, the Lord has challenged me. The Lord has challenged me to, are you willing to obey me? Are you going to do what I told you to do? Do you know there are subjects in the Bible that if it were up to me, I would have rewritten a couple of them? (laughs) There's things that are in the Word. I'm kind of like, I don't know if I really like that whole lot. But God didn't ask my opinion. He just told me that's what you're supposed to say, and you say it and let the results lie with me. Increasingly, that's going to not be a fun, popular kind of a thing. Saul had that problem, and it ruined his life. Saul's insecurities grew and grew. In the book of 1 Samuel, we're looking at the lives of two men, primarily right now King Saul, and we're examining why Israel made a mistake in choosing a human king. And Samuel, you wanted a human king, you thought it was a great idea? It's not a great idea. Because if you do that, you're going to become, as a nation like America, you wear the kind of jeans people tell you to wear, and those are too baggy, those are too thin. You wear your hair the way you're supposed to wear it. You say certain phrases. Oh, that, I, we'd stop saying that months ago. That's, that's past now. The music we listen to, shows we watch, that's... I, I've told my wife for years I've been baffled by what's cool. Who, who decided that? Was there a meeting somewhere? I missed the meeting, and this is cool, that's not cool. You can't say this. You've got to look like this. That's America. And when you choose a human king, they said, we want one, because that's what the other nations have. They have a human king. We want a king like they have. And God said, they've not rejected you to Samuel. They've rejected me. So what's it look like to learn from God's rule in our lives? Because everybody in this room shares common problems. All of you may not struggle with insecurity like I do at times. You may struggle with being mean or judgmental. You may be maybe pride or ang- you know, whatever it might be, anger, lust, laziness, whatever it is, touches all of us. So we can learn from the book of uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel, And this is the main idea today in case you miss it. When we allow our insecurities to grow, they cause us to value man's approval over God's. When we allow insecurity to grow in our life, we want man's approval instead of God's. And a like becomes more valuable to us as we're having a discussion on Facebook or whatever it might be. That becomes more important to us than whether it's true and right. Objective truth is starting to go by the wayside. So let's talk about the setting. And here's where we come to the first part of your uh, your handouts. This is an abbreviation, believe it or not. But this is a, a particular problem that people have criticized Christians for for a long time, the Lord in particular. Here's what it says. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek, for what he did to Israel. When Israel was coming out of Egypt, they attacked the stragglers in the back and and killed them mercilessly. How he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. Kill both man and woman, woman, infant, nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. It's interesting for a lot of reasons, but the, the concern and that which you have in your notes is, the concern is, How can a loving God command the death of the Amalekites? Women, children, men, animals. So a couple thoughts here and more in the back. We'll talk about it more tonight. But don't make the mistake Job and his friends made. Job and his friends thought that they knew everything there was to know about his situation. Job, your children died. All your goods are gone. You must be a bad person. You've sinned. And God didn't like the way they represented him and said, you're going to die unless Job prays for you. It's like, Job, old buddy, just you and me, right? And he did and they didn't. 
But with Job, he looked at the situation. He said, I haven't done anything wrong, but all this has happened. Therefore, God, you're wrong. And God said, Job, you don't know how to run this universe. You don't know all the facts. You need to be more careful. And Job said, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. That's the mistake we make. We think we know all about the situation. And the syllogism is, a good God would never order the death of infants. God ordered the death of infants. Therefore, God's not good. But what I would say to you is this, that's wrong because the major premise is flawed. A finite God, maybe, but an infinite God who knows things we don't know, who knows the future, who knows all about people, who knows all the situations and all the ins and the outs, that's different. An infinite God can't be judged by finite people. And what God said to Job is, I know how to run the universe, you don't. God proved his love for people. In Deuteronomy 149, uh, 39, the, he's talking to the kids of the wilderness generation. He says, your parents who said your little ones, you would be a prey, they're going to go in. Your little ones are going to go in. And he spared everybody from 20 years old on down. You know what that means? God cares about age. It matters to him, and he cares about little ones. Last week, we spent a whole sermon talking about how God cares about children, and he's proven it. He says it explicitly. In your notes, it says that in Matthew 18, he says, it is not the will of your father that one of these little ones perish. And he's talking about unbelievers as well as believers. In the book of Jonah, you remember Jonah, that great man of faith, he came and he said, kill them all. And he sat on the mountain and was waiting for it. And God said, Jonah, this is a city with 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left, as well as many animals. Jonah, why would I kill the kids and the animals? And these are the enemies of Israel. If, if that was typical with God, why didn't he say, you know, you're right, they're the bad guys. Because when God judges, that's the noise it makes. But he doesn't do it. And he's appalled that Jonah would want to do it. So why the Amalekites? That's right, we don't know why the Amalekites. Why the, do you know that there is a biblical, there's biblical evidence that there were genetic issues with the intermarriage of the angels of God and the daughters of men. And they were concerned about the offspring that produced and what it might do to the world. I have a question for you. If God knew that, the, that there was a corruption in the human race, is it possible that he ordered the killing because he knew what it would do to humanity to let those offspring go on? Is that possible? Sure, it's possible. Do you know whether that was the case? No, we don't. But you don't indict God for what you don't know. There's a lot of reasons he may have commanded. When people are involved in sexual perversions, other oftentimes there's hygiene issues that can spread not only to animals, but of course other people. And <laughs> when you talk about the Canaanite women, they caused the men of Israel because of intermarriage and their gods following false gods, idolatry. It caused the death of hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children because they defected from God. Is that a reason? Sure could have been but you don't know, and neither do I. And there's, if as a finite person we can think of reasons, an infinite God sure can. Quite an assumption to judge a God who's proven that he's righteous, but the reality is, for many of us, we just don't like God's rule, and we don't want it over our life, and we don't trust him. Nothing demonstrates this more, the hypocrisy of people, than the current abortion debate. People that are claim to value life sure don't seem to at times. So, we'll talk more about that tonight, gentlemen, in more specifics, but this is what Richard Dawkins said. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. When the facts are seen, God is the most compelling real character, not fiction, in all of real history, Mr. Dr. Dawkins. So, what I would say to him is simply this, don't cherry pick the facts and draw conclusions when we're ignorant. Let's talk about the exception to this, the Kenites. You go, oh, the Kenites, like the Amalekites, mosquito bites. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them into lame, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in the weight in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, go depart, get down from you among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with him. For you showed kindness. They killed, attacked innocent men, women, and children. 
You showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. The Kenites left, and you say, gee, how boring, really? What it shows you is when they respected the people of God, God respected them, and he showed mercy. Very strong contrast between the last passage. But let's talk about the attack now. So Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amal- Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling, da-dum, that's the music that comes in here, to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless. Yeah, we don't want that stuff. They utterly destroyed. So let's talk a little bit about this. Well, let's go on and read, because I want to come back and talk about this. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah. Whoops, sorry. Saul's encounter with Samuel uh, is in 10 through 39. Samuel's not happy, because Saul doesn't do what he's supposed to do. So specifically now, let's look at the lie. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. He cried out to the Lord all night. You see Samuel's heart? He really cared about what was going on. He cared about his protege here. When Samuel arose in the morning, early in the morning, to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, humble man that he was, And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to to him, Hey, good to see you. Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You're dreaming. So after he says that to Samuel, Samuel's reaction is this. He talks about this situation. Here's what he says to him. Samuel says, really, you did everything you're supposed to do? What's the bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, abadiyah, abadiyah, abadiyah. They brought them from the, they brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. Why? Hey. He disobeyed to honor God, to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest, hey, all the rest of it we destroyed. We just wanted sacrifices. So let's talk about the confrontation about this. Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. I'll tell you what the Lord told me last night. He said, speak on. (laughs) Yeah, you're in trouble. Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, did you catch that? Because this has been an ongoing theme with him. Do you remember what happened when he was told to be king? His uncle said, hey, what happened? He said, ah, found the donkeys. They came back. Not a word about being anointed king. And then when they went to look for him, anybody remember where he was? Hiding in the luggage, right? You were little in your own eyes. Here's the point. Were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? God is the one who put you in this position. God is the one who gave you this authority. Now, when he sent you on the mission, he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? He's the one that gave you this authority. Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And then the rationalization. Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, uh uh-oh, And I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, it's them. They took the plunder, the sheep, the oxen, the best of things, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. Let's talk. Let's talk about this. Several things that we probably should focus on in your notes. One of the most common issues in life is insecurity and the need for the approval of others. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. And you might say, I don't fear people, really. 
So you would go ahead and wear clothes that are out of style, wouldn't bother you. Wear your hair in a way that others think are dumb, it wouldn't bother you. You would, you would go against the grain. You'd argue with people when you know that you'd get condemned publicly on one of the social media platforms. You would stand up. You haven't been quiet at work. You've gone ahead and spoke out when you needed to speak out about what's right and what's wrong. You've gone ahead and taken a stand the way you have. Sometimes I fudge on those things. And sometimes I'll compromise because... I want people's approval, and the Spirit of God appropriately convicts me. But the problem is, what he's saying that you can do is, the fear of man brings a snare. It's a trap for you. It's going to pull you away from the Lord. All kinds of Christian children have gone to college and compromised sexually with their habits, getting drunk, doing drugs, and so on. Why? Because they wanted to fit in. When I was younger, I've said before, I started smoking on a paper route at 14 years old, 13 years old, and why did I do it? I didn't want, I, you know, I don't know if any of you smoke cigarettes, but if you have or if you do, I will tell you when you take that first drag, your body goes, don't do it. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts a lot. And that's your body's way of saying, this is really stupid. And I did it anyway, and I kept doing it, and it kept hurting, and I kept doing it, and it kept hurting. Why? Because my friend smoked. That's why I smoked. And when I first smoked, when I went to a show with a guy, a buddy of mine, and he brought some gin with him, and we drank that, it tasted horrible. I thought, soda's a lot better than this. Everything else is a lot better than this. This is rank. I remember drinking some of my father's beer when I was young. It tasted like vomit. <laughs> and so I'm drinking this, and, but why do you keep drinking that? Because my friends did, because I wanted their approval. Same thing when I first did drugs. I didn't have a desire to do that. I did it because my friends had it. I thought, okay. They did it. I want to be part of them. I compromised morally in my life over and over and over again. And I did it so that my friends would accept me and approve me. I know none of you have ever done that. But it's a very dangerous thing. And so it brings a snare. So it's pleasing God versus pleasing people. Whose approval do you want in life? Do you want God's or do you want man's? It's hard with the Lord because we don't see him because he's not here. Number two, acting on our insecurity leads to blaming, rationalizing, and making excuses. It's true. I oftentimes would blame my friends for things because, and rationalize it, you know. I wanted to be with them. They were my buddies, and, you know. I remember becoming a Christian as a brand new Christian. I still was playing in the band I was in, and then after we were done, my friends would say, you want to get a case of beer? Uh, yeah. Atta boy, Dan. And I'd be going to Bible studies during the week. And, on the, and, and then on the weekends, we'd play our gigs, and I'd compromise over and over again. Finally, after a couple months of a foot in and a foot out, I went to my friends and I said, I need to get out of the band. It's not you, it's me. I have a hard time saying no to you guys. Not your fault. But I would rationalize and I would excuse and I would blame. Remember Eve? Did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? Uh, yeah. We did. The woman gave me the food, and so that's why I did it, because of her. boy, Adam. Men have been blaming it ever since. John 4, 12, 42 is interesting. It tells us that many rulers became believers. Many of the rulers, therefore, believed on him, but they were not openly confessing him. Why? For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Let's pretend that we're not crazy. I, I realize it's a leap. But let's pretend that we're not crazy. Let's pretend that Jesus Christ really does exist, that he really is God. Let's pretend this is not all there is. Let's pretend that he really is coming back, that there really is a heaven and a hell. Let's pretend that the kingdom is coming. And let's pretend that we may have, maybe today, we may have a very short time in this world, and it may be that very soon you and I are forever in the kingdom with Jesus Christ. And when we get there, there's going to be an evaluation for believers. For unbelievers, are you in the book of life? And you say, oh, I wonder, wonder. Are you in the book of life? That's a big question. Are you there? When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're there. For believers, there's a judgment seat of Christ. And he evaluates you for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. What do you want him to say to you on that day? What's, what's it worth for you to throw away greater rule, greater privilege, greater way of honoring Jesus Christ? Number three, talk about feelings of insecurity and inferiority. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 says, not that we are adequate in ourselves to think of anything as coming from ourselves. Our adequacy is from God. 
And so you say, well, I'm not very good at this. I'm not very good at this. I'm not very good at this. That's the kind of person God looks for, someone that he can strengthen to serve him in the right way. But it says God made us adequate as ministers of a new covenant. It can create a fear of failure. Do you remember the parable of the minas? Do you remember that? God passes out what I think are opportunities, right? And so they pass them out in the 10 faithful, well done, good and faithful servant, 10 cities. Next one, kind of faithful, five cities. Do you remember what the last man said to him? I knew that you were an austere master. I was afraid of you. And so I went and I hid it. See, his perception of God impacted the way he lives, and that's true with us too. But his perception was, hey, you're, you're really harsh, and so I hid it. I didn't use it. The fear of failure. I didn't want to blow it. Weaknesses are a training ground. Do you remember where Paul, the Bible tells an interesting story of Paul being exalted to the third heaven. First heaven is probably what we call our sky, atmospheric world. Second heaven, what we call outer space. Third heaven is where God dwells. Paul was exalted to the third heaven and apparently was impressive because Paul says, I saw things I couldn't put into words. And so when he came back, God wanted to ensure that he didn't exalt himself. And it says that he was given a thorn in the flesh that buffeted him. In the original language, it knocked him around. And he says, and he says concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I love that three times. Really, Lord, I was serious the first time. I really would like you to take this away. And then after the third time, the Lord says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. He didn't take it away. So he says, most gladly, therefore, I'll rather boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may be seen in me. And sometimes God allows things to keep us from pride. For whatever reason it might be, we always think, what have I done wrong? Paul hadn't done anything wrong. But it was an opportunity to grow and to be strengthened. Lord, thank you for that weakness. David is given 400 men. And the Bible says there were all kinds of losers that came to him. That's not the Hebrew word, but people that came to him that really were not great people. And David, you say, why would God allow that? It served as a training ground for David to become king. If you can take care of these 400 guys, you can rule the nation because they're a mess. It's a training ground. And maybe you're at a job where you say, I can't stand my job. I can't stand what's going on in my job. And maybe the Lord's training you. And the Lord will give you things in life so that it can strengthen you. So some of you are probably saying, I understand my marriage better. So let's go to the next couple verses here. (laughs) So the problem is they love the approval of man more than the approval of God. So the rejection and the explanation here. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice. I was working at Bishop Business Equipment when I was a teenager. Mrs. Bishop, grandma to Mr. Bishop that owned it was there. And I said to her, she was, I was been a Christian about a year. I said, what's the, what's the bottom line of the Christian life? Can you sum it up in one word? <laughs> Great question. She said, if I had to pick a word, I'd pick obedience. Great summary. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of rams. Rebellion's like witchcraft. You know, it's like crucio. It's like witchcraft. It's divination. You're trying to tell the future. You're relying on something other than the Lord. You're you're trying to determine. When you rebel, you're saying, that's not the right way to do it. I want to do it my way. You're trying to determine future. You're making someone else God. Look at this. Look at the next phrase. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. If you tell God no, who's God in your life? If you tell God no, who's God in your life? You are. And you're not as great as he is. You're not as wise. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. I want to make a point from this. Number four, when we rebel, we're acting like those who practice witchcraft. We're turning to supernatural forces. You're taking the wrong side. You're saying, I know better than God in this case. Disobedience is like idolatry. It's foolish. It reflects stubbornness. Look at Isaiah 44. I kind of like this. I really like it all, but this is really kind of cool. Isaiah 44, and I love the sarcasm that the Lord uses here. Pretty cool. 44, 9 through 20 says this. (laughs) I love the imagery, guys. 
those who make a graven image, all of them are useless. All their precious things shall not profit. They are their own witness. They neither know, see nor know that they may be ashamed. Who would form a God or cast a graven image that profits him nothing? Surely all his companions would be ashamed. And the workmen, they're mere men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them all stand up, yet they shall fear. They shall be ashamed together. The blacksmith, blacksmith with the tongs works one in the coals, fashions it with a hammer, and works it with the strength of his arms. Even so, he's hungry, his strength fails, faints no wa- he drinks no water, is faint. And he talks about how he makes it, in verses 13 and following, the figure of a man. According to the beauty of a man that it may remain in his house, he hews down cedars for himself, cuts down trees, secures it for himself, plants a pine, the rain nourishes it. And then he says he takes part of that tree that he's cut down, he takes part of it and he burns it to keep himself warm. He takes the other part and he puts it on an idol and he takes it to his house and he sets it up because it can't move and he bows down to it. That makes sense. That makes sense. So he mocks those who are idol worshipers. So stubbornness is arrogance. Stubborn people are like those who follow idols. When we're stubborn and disobey, we're putting ourselves in the place of God. Who's God in your life? Who tells you what to do? Who tells you what to do? Let's go on. The confession without repentance and repair. Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, for I've transgressed. This is not the normal word for sin. I overlooked it. He softens it. I, I really didn't pay the attention I should have paid. Overlooked it. The commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. When you give in on one of your social media platforms and you do what they want you to do, when you drink, drink like I drank, or when you smoke or when you do drugs like I do, when you become immoral like I did, and you do those things, who are you obeying? I feared the people. I obeyed their voice. Now, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He still got that issue of insecurity, but he finally, was this the fourth time? Okay, I was wrong. No more blaming, no more excusing. Samuel said to Saul, I won't return with you for you've rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And so it cost him and sin will do that in our lives. It costs us. Now the illustration but Samuel said to Saul, I, um, but as Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. Remember, David was a man after God's own heart. How was he a man after God's heart? He obeyed the Lord. He did what he told him to do. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent for he is not a man that he should relent. And in saying that there's times where God makes that decision and he says, I'm not changing no matter what your behavior is. This is a done deal. So I want to get to the epilogue with you. Three painful endings. Here's number one. I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. What a tragic ending this is for this man. I want your approval. I want people to see me. I want people to see me as spiritual. I don't want to be embarrassed before them. I've lost the kingdom, but please make me look good in their eyes. What a terribly sad ending. Samuel said, bring Agag, the king of the Amalekites here. So Agag came to him cautiously and Agag Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. (laughs) No. But Samuel said, as the sword has made, your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Saul, Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Israel was an instrument of God in the world, and this is a man that had murdered men, women, and children, and he suffered capital punishment. Sad ending for him, but look at the ending here. Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he made him king over Israel. So I have a question for you about this. Every believer has God's acceptance. Every believer will get into eternity. Every believer will be in heaven. Every believer will be in the kingdom. But acceptance is not the same as approval. So I have a question for you. What are your insecurities doing in your life? 
how are they driving you with your friends? Maybe you go out and say, yeah, we drink. We don't get drunk that often. Somebody, a good friend of mine, said not long ago, I wonder if 30 years ago we would have watched the same movies that we watch today. Now, maybe some of you say, well, we've matured. We know better. But you know, it's interesting, the process. I used this illustration years ago. I kind of like it. The, the process I had told you years ago, those of you, some of you new here, I'll tell you the story about my mother giving me a guitar, and she bought an inexpensive guitar. And I don't know how many of you have tried to play guitar or a stringed instrument, but the reality is that it takes a while to develop calluses. And the problem was that there was a fretboard that had strings about that high off the fretboard. And I understood after I tried to play why they call it a fretboard because it was painful, and that's when I became a drummer. But you know, the reality is that you develop calluses and that you need calluses to play instruments like that. You develop it over time. And you know that's happened with many people that are here today, including myself at times. The reality is that uh, after a while, yeah, they're swearing. It's just not really bad swearing. Yeah, they use really bad swearing, but it's not that much. And sure, there are scenes, that are there, but they don't show very much when they do it. Yeah, they show a lot, but it's really brief. What in the world has happened to us? Where in the world have our standards of decency gone? In terms of the way we talk to one another, in terms of the things we watch, in terms of what our children do. We're so consumed with our children giving us their approval that we'll ruin their lives. We don't spend time in the word like we should or in prayer like we should. We don't discipline the way we should because we're terrified of their reaction. Are you loving your children? Are we loving our children? Or do we want our children's approval so bad that we'll go ahead and let them go off course because the Bible says that if you love your children, you'll discipline them. If you love them, you'll teach them. And if you're feeling like I'm shooting at you, I'm, not, I'm talking about me every bit as well, and that includes adult children as well. We want to be gracious. We want to be kind. What about our friends? When the guy said to me, you want to get a case of beer after we played, and I said, yeah, these were my closest friends, and I was helping them go to hell. My closest friends. It was more important to me that my close friends liked me than for me to give them a Christian witness. And these are my friends. I love them. I love them. My hypocrisy was unbelievable. What is it in our lives today? Whose approval are you living for? Are you an insecure person? Do you do things because of insecurity? Are you allowing your sense of insecurity, insecurity, inadequacy, inferiority, are you letting that drive your life? Laughing at jokes you shouldn't laugh at? Telling them? Doing things you shouldn't do because I want so bad for other people to approve of me. They love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And so, now we have a group of people in America who have established a new Bible, and it's their political correctness. And they're saying, this is the way you should behave morally. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. And what's strange to me is that for many of us that are listening today, for many of us, we'll take their Bible over that Bible. And the reason this chapter is in 1 Samuel is to tell you the tragedy of the life of someone who loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. As the rest of the band is coming forward, as the music team comes up here, would you pray with me as we get ready to continue our worship today? Thank you, Father, for teaching us. Thank you for the warning. Oh, I, this, is, this is an area uh, so subtly comes up in my life. And uh, Lord, I, I don't know how it develops in it, but it develops in us. Give us the grace to love you, to want your approval, to live for you, because it's not only right, it's best for us and for our children, our spouses, those that we love. Help us to care about them enough to obey you. In Christ's name, amen. You guys would like to stand with us. Let's worship.
Indescribable, uncontainable. 
seated. Part of what makes him amazing is the fact that living forever depends completely on the finality of the work at the cross. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Not so much? Aren't you glad that everything's been paid for? Aren't you glad that when he offered his blood, he went into the Holy of Holies in the heavenlies? He took his blood, the Bible says, into the Holy of Holies. He offered it to God. The resurrection was God saying to all of us, I accept it. And when he said it was finished, it was a translation of one word in the original. And that same word, when you would pay off a debt to Telestai was written across that bill, paid in full. That's why we take the cup. Let's pray. Father, you truly are amazing and you provided salvation in the only way it could have been provided. For that, we thank you. In Christ's name, amen. If you guys would like to stand. We have one more song before we close. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Some bright morning when the sun is on. Yeah. 
be okay with you if that was today? Man, oh man, oh man, that would be all right with me. I hope that, um, hope you're praying for that. Hope you're praying for that. Hey, an announcement that has nothing to do with flying away. We're only tearing down the tables today. Leave the chairs where they are. Hopefully Jesus will take us, chairs or not. <laughs> Live for Jesus. He told you to do that. He told us to do that. Not just because it was what we're supposed to do, but it's best for us. It's best for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, maybe it will be today. I pray you'll consider that. Lord, in Psalm 2, it says that the Father will give you the kingdom when you ask him. So Lord Jesus, we would just ask you to ask him. Come back in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great week, y'all.